Hello everyone and welcome to Beach Erosion. Uh, this is one of the things that we talk about that I think is maybe uh, most important uh, because this is something that happens you know right in here in Pinellas County. Uh, it's happening right over there and it's something that affects each and every one of you even if you don't live on the beach. Uh, our county throws a lot of money at these problems and so we want to make sure that we, uh, we want to make sure that we understand what's going on here. So let's begin by talking about waves, because waves are kind of at the center of, of everything that's going on here. So remember that waves are transmitting energy from one place to another, not water um, in the open ocean anyway. Um, so that wave goes by, and the water that made up the wave is right back where it started, but the energy uh, goes on, and that energy comes from the wind. And so, uh, so when we think about waves, we really do need to think about wind. So if we think about this, um, let's say that you live in Kansas in the middle of the United States and you want to go surfing. Uh, so you saved up your money and you're going to take a week long surfing vacation. Okay. All else being equal, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to the East coast, say Virginia, uh, or maybe North Carolina? Um, or are you going to go to the West Coast, say maybe California, okay? Well, odds are you're going to go to the West Coast, okay? Waves out there are bigger in the Pacific than they are in the Atlantic, generally. Um, okay, so let's do it again. Let's say you live in Orlando and you want to go surfing. Uh, and so you're pretty much equally distant from the East Coast of Florida and the West Coast of Florida, right? The Atlantic or the Gulf. Uh, you're going to go to the Atlantic, right? Because the waves there are generally all else being equal, uh, bigger than the waves in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, right? So let's do it one more time. Let's say you live in Pinellas County, right? And you want to surf, at least go to the Gulf of Mexico side, right? Nobody surfs in uh, Tampa Bay, except for those kite surfing, but that's obviously a different thing. So yeah, so, so it would seem at first glance that the size of the wave is directly proportional to the size of the body of water which is true but you start wondering why would that be i mean it, it seems intuitive but lots of things seem intuitive that are just flat wrong so so it would be nice if we knew why larger bodies of water produce larger waves and it turns out there's a good reason and it's called fetch um, fetch is the distance over which the wind can blow undisturbed, right? And the Pacific is a lot bigger than the Atlantic and so has a lot more distance over which uh, that wind can blow undisturbed, making bigger waves, right? Um, the Atlantic is bigger than the Gulf of Mexico, and the Gulf of Mexico is bigger than Tampa Bay. And, you know, you even see this if you just look at little um, enclosed boat inlets in Tampa Bay, where the water in the bay might be kind of choppy, and the water in that uh, little boat area is not, because... It's only got 50 feet of fetch, right? And so, and so, so fetch is important. Um, and is why, you know, generally speaking, so oh, my phone is ringing, uh, which is why, generally speaking, larger bodies of water um, produce larger waves. Now, what else, though? Well, um, put a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico and surfs up. Now, don't go surfing in a hurricane. If you do, don't tell them I told you to, but, but right, but you know, but you know, if you've ever gone out and looked at things when there's a, a hurricane or a tropical storm out there, you know, waves are pretty good. They really are. And so, yeah, so the speed of the wind matters, right? Um, um, I'm recording this just a day after a hurricane, hurricane, tropical storm Ada came through Tampa Bay. Um, and I would imagine there was some pretty good surf out there, uh, during, uh, during that tropical storm. Uh, the other thing that matters is the duration of the wind. The picture is exactly the same, but the word changed. Okay. The duration of the wind. Um, Simply put, the longer it blows, the better it is, right? And so, I mean, you could have a, um, a you know, a, a water spout out there blowing, uh, you know, a couple hundred miles an hour, but if it only lasts, you know, three minutes, meh, not going to be a thing, right? On the other hand, a hurricane sitting out there for three or four days, that's going to do some coastal erosion. So you need to, you know, you need to watch out for that. So, so yeah, so fetch. 
the speed of the wind and the duration of the wind are the three things that go into creating a wave and kind of determining how big it's going to be. Now, there's a little bit of terminology we want to get. Um, and uh, it just has to do with waves and it's not, not hard or, or counterintuitive or anything like that. So when someone asks how big is the wave, what they're usually asking about is the wave height, right? The distance from the trough to the crest of the wave, that's the wave height. Uh, when people say seas are running three to five feet, that's what they're talking about, is the wave height. Um, what's maybe a little bit more important, though, is the wavelength, right? I'm going to go ahead and get my little laser pointer thing you're going here, is the wavelength, right? That's the distance traditionally measured from one crest to the next crest, although you could measure it trough to trough if you wanted, man, whatever, crest to crest, okay? This is how quote-unquote long the wave is. And it's a lot more important because wavelength determines my, my fourth bullet point here, wave base. And that is the depth below which the water is no longer moving due to the wave, right? And so if you're below wave base, uh, you'll never know the wave is there. It'll go right over your head. You'll never know it. Wave base is one half of the wavelength, right? So if the wavelength is 10 meters, wave base is 5 meters. And so if you're 6 meters down, that or, or, you know, or 5 meters and 1 centimeter, right, below 5 meters... That wave will go right over your head. You'll never know it. Uh, and more importantly, if the water's deeper than that, that wave is not interacting with the bottom. Okay? Remember when we talked about tsunamis? I showed that tsunami warning system. Right? Tsunamis have wavelengths of hundreds of miles. So even in the open ocean, they reach the bottom, which is why you can put a pressure transducer down there, and that tsunami will pop that pressure transducer and let you know there's a big wave out there. Right? Um, um, otherwise, you might not even know it's there, because those things pass underneath boats in the open ocean, and they just, they just never even know they're there. So, so anyway, so we worry more about wave base. Um, or rather wavelength, because it determines wave base, right? Whenever I go scuba diving for, for fun or work, you know, I get seasick. <laughs> and so, right, first thing I do before I jump off that boat is look out and estimate the wavelength so I know how far down I have to go before things stop moving and my inner ear is happy with me again. So, yeah, so, so wave base. Uh, and that'll come up again. Uh, also, wave period, just the time it takes for one wavelength to pass a fixed point. So if you're standing on the beach and bam, you get hit with a wave, and I don't know, 15 seconds later, bam, you get hit with another wave, that's the wave period, right? It depends on the speed and the length, and oceanographers and uh, physics people have all kinds of formulas they can plug into relating those things to each other. But there we go, there's our terminology. Now, I mentioned that um, in the open ocean, the wave is just moving energy, Sorry, I need a little water. Um, I'm going to cough anyway. Um, <coughs> um, in the open ocean, the wave is just moving energy. Now, at the beach, that changes, right? What you see at the beach is not typical. If you've ever been out uh, deep sea fishing or out, um, you know, offshore a bit, um, for whatever reason, you know that, you know, you get a wave and then, you know, I don't know, you know, a, a while longer, you'll get another wave. They're not stacked up the way they are on the beach, right? And so, yeah, at the beach, you know, once the water depth gets below wave base, right, it gets equal to one half the wave, like now that wave is interacting with the bottom, right? It's kicking up sand. It's starting to move water now. It's starting to move sediment now. And it also begins to slow down. Uh, and so the wave behind it will catch up with it, and that shortens the wavelength. So when you're at the beach, you're kind of seeing a, uh, a wave traffic jam there. As the ones in front slow down, and the ones behind them catch up, and then the ones behind them catch up, etc., etc. Eventually, this is obviously this is not sustainable, right? The water's getting shallower. Uh, the wave is interacting more and more with the bottom. Um, about at about one twentieth the wavelength, the wave will break, right? And you can see here this rotating 
body of water kind of with this tube in it the water and the wave is always rotating right if i go back here you know they, they show these little circles here because that's the direction the water and the wave that's what the water and wave always does it rotates in a circle as you go down the circles get smaller until they cease to exist so so you know this this what that we see here is really just an expression of something that's always there. That's just how the water and the wave moves. Now, though, it's out of water, and it doesn't have enough water to fill in the tube, um, and so and now it's breaking, and it's moving water, and it's moving sediment, and it has been since it started feeling bottom. Right. Uh, this is just a picture I snapped on St. Pete Beach, and you can see, you know, there's a wave, there's a wave, there's a wave, there's a wave. Right, they're stacked up. And if you've been to the beach, and we've probably all been to the beach, we know that it's just one after another, after another, after another at the beach. It's not that way in the open ocean, right? And sometimes these waves are big, that tube is big, but that, that circular motion of the water in the wave is always there. It's just as it approaches shore and it runs out of water, that becomes more evident. And like I said, from the time that wave... Um, starts to feel bottom so you know if the wavelength here is let's say 10 meters once the water depth is shallower than five meters you're moving sand you're moving sand you're moving water you're interacting with the bottom and so that can be a problem because you know those waves are constant and they can do a lot of work on that beach and i mean work in the in the like the, the way a physicist would use it you know which is just moving something quickly or whatever okay um they can do a lot of work on that beach, and that is not always good. So when a geologist or an oceanographer or a geomorphologist or someone looks at a beach, what we really see is just a river of sand. And once you kind of know what to look for, you will too. Okay, uh, there's a lot of sand being moved across the beach face. Uh, the two numbers that I have, New Jersey, about 750,000 tons per year. California, bigger waves, more energy, uh, about one and a half million tons per year. So in other words, and in and, and, um, uh, Clearwater, Pinellas County, it varies a lot for, depending on where you go. Um, let's say around a million tons per year in the in that range. OK, probably closer to New Jersey than California. OK, Um um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so what I mean by that is if you stand at a fixed point, there's about a million tons of sand per year getting moved past you. That's a lot of sand. That is an awful lot of sand. And so, um, and so, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's frequently like being removed from places we would rather it be and being deposited in places we would rather it not be. And so it turns out that it really can be kind of a problem. So what's moving this sand though? Well, a couple things. First of all, beach drift, right? And let me, let me go to the next slide because I got pictures. Okay. So, uh, beach drift, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, beach drift. The idea here is that waves, if you'll notice when you go to the beach, waves are rarely, if ever, coming in and breaking straight on the beach. They're almost always coming in at an angle around uh, Pinellas County. That angle is usually, but not always, but usually from the north. Um, not always, and it depends on where you are, so meh, I'm generalizing, but that's okay. Um, waves come in, they break uh, at an angle that sends sand up the beach, along the along the beach and then it comes then the water washes back down and then the next wave comes in and breaks that sends sand up the beach and you can see how uh sand is just going to kind of zigzag its way up the beach face and if you've ever stood right here you know ankle deep in water you know it does not take long at all uh before your feet are covered in sand um some of it's because you're sinking down i get it but a lot of it is because sand is being washed over your feet Okay, so you're tired of standing uh, on the beach. You jump in the water right about here, literally like chest deep, not deep, you know, just, you know, and you're not paying attention and you're not paying attention and you're getting drift. You're getting kind of floated down the beach a bit, right? Until, you know, you look up and you're down here and maybe your towel and umbrella is up here, right? Congratulations. You just discovered the longshore current. 
And once again, usually the pinellas kind of north to south, but not always. Okay, not always. But yeah, okay, there it is. Right, and you you know if you've ever been to the beach in the water, you know it's there. Okay, it's set up by wave energy coming in. It just kind of sets up a, a a little current out here running downstream relative to the wave direction. Um, and both of these move sand along that beach. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they're moving it away from places we would like it to be and to places we would not like it to be. And so this uh, this can be a problem. It really can. So let's think about this a little bit. When people talk about beaches, uh, they, they like to talk about stabilizing the shore. Right, beaches are very dynamic places. There's a lot going on on our beaches, and uh, and unfortunately, we have stuff on our beaches, and those two things do not always get along. And so, there's two things going on here. The first is indeed the longshore current we just talked about. Okay, we'll talk about that. But then the other thing is something that we generally call beach erosion, and that is the movement of the beach inland. Now, those are two different things, okay? Uh, as we'll see, people like to kind of lump them together and call it all beach erosion or something like that, but but there's two different things going on here. We need, we need to understand that. So let's think about longshore current and beach drift first, okay? And so when we think about beaches, especially in Pinellas County, um, a lot of them are barrier islands, right? They're these, they're these very, very thin islands, um, and uh, and and the thing here is, barrier islands move. Okay, they move downstream relative to that longshore current. I'll show you how here in just a moment. But this is the the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in Cape Hatteras, uh, North Carolina. It's a very historic lighthouse. Uh, it was used during the Civil War. I think it might it might even go back to the Revolutionary War. I don't know. I don't know if it goes back that far. I know it goes back to the Civil War. So so it's a very old, very historic lighthouse. And it was in danger of being washed into the Atlantic Ocean. It was sitting down here, uh, and they put in a little groin, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but it was sitting down here, and it was it was it was going to get washed away. It was only a few feet away from getting washed away. Here, I'll show you. So here's here's a Google Earth image. We're going to look at a lot of Google Earth images today. That's where the lighthouse was, uh, and that's not going to work. Um, and so they moved it to here, um, and they did so simply because that barrier island was moving out from under, and this is the thing, right? When I say barrier islands move, I don't mean like tectonic plates move. I mean like feet per year uh, in a way that, that threatens um, structures and all kinds of things, and so it really, it really can be a problem. And so uh, there's the site. Like I said, the lighthouse was here. That's not going to work. And now when they built it, it probably seem like it would work just fine but that was some time ago and now it's here where it is presumably safe so what's this deal with barrier islands moving okay well look here's and cloak key right this is a nice um pristine barrier island off the coast of pinellas county um and this is what barrier island should look like right when you see all that weird stuff behind it with how behind them with houses and things that's that's just real estate right that's just just sand that someone dumped into the intercoastal waterway to build houses on and and you know that right that's not natural this is what a natural bear island should look like and so what happens is here a longshore current is dominantly north to south like i said it changes up every now and then but mostly north to south so what it does is it removes sediment from the north end in this case and puts it on the south end right and so north into south end north mostly north into south end. and you can see these lobes building out here in fact you can see them even better when i zoom in on that south side right you can see these lobes building up you know there's a lobe of sand there's one you know here's a big there's an you know you can see all the sand being deposited on the south side Right where it's being removed from the north side, so that produces a net movement of this island north to south. So if you build something up here, it's probably not going to take too long before you're in a position like they were in Cape Hatteras to have to move a structure or abandon it, right? And so, yeah, so barrier islands move. Now, uh, here's the trick though, right? Pinellas County is a, a beach, Pinellas County beaches are a series of barrier islands. And so if the islands move, 
that means that the gaps in between the islands also move, right? And so here, this is Honeymoon Island to the north. Really nice natural area. If you ever want to go to a beach uh, that's kind of nice and natural, that Honeymoon Island is a good option. Uh, costs a few bucks to get onto it, but there it is, right? And so, and then this is, this will be Clearwater further south. So I don't know what the island is called, Clearwater Island. This would be Clearwater Beach further south. Okay, so, um, but you can see here, this lobe of sand being built up uh, off the off of, on the south side of Honeymoon Island, and then you can also see here sand being removed from the north end of Clearwater Island, right? And so that means that that gap is moving. Now, in this particular case, this is a natural area. This is a natural area. It can be left to move, no problem. Right? And that's the way you'd really like things to be, right? Is but. They're not, right? They're not. Uh, and, and, you know, in most cases, you've got infrastructure there. You've got people living there. You've got all kinds of things going on there. And so we can't, you know, I mean, I'm all for, well, never. You know, I'm all for, you know, getting people off the beaches and letting them do whatever they want. But that's not going to happen. That that's that, And rightfully so. I mean, people, you know, people have a right to live places. So, um, so sorry. Don't mean to go all weird on you there. But anyway, um, yeah. So, we, ha you know, we, we have infrastructure there. We have roads and houses and things. So, we can't have these gaps moving. From just a practical point of view, it's not going to work. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we build jetties a lot of times, right? Jetties are these um, these walls. You can see one here, and you can see one here. And we build these out into the water, out into And what that does is that shuts down the longshore current, right? Because there's a current flowing across here. And, and if you build a wall out into it, that shuts it down. Well, when you shut that down, you accumulate sand, right? It drops its sand. So these jetties tend to drop sand on the upstream side which is fine the problem is on the downstream side right where you starve for sand and now this beach has to come into equilibrium and a lot of times it comes into equilibrium a few hundred feet further inland than it was right i mean if we kind of draw a straight line from this beach i'm trying not to cheat over here we can see that that that's a couple hundred feet, um, you know, um, uh, what's the direction the north is up, so that's going to be east uh, of, of where it maybe should be out here, right? And so, but look what they did, right? They didn't do anything here, right? It's a park. You might have been to it, right? That's what you want to do, right? When you put a jetty in, you want to be really careful what you do downstream because you're going to get erosion on that downstream a lot of times. Not all the time. I'll show you some examples where you don't, but a lot of times you're going to get erosion erosion on that downstream side right and so go to someone who knows what they're talking about and say hey 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 if we put a jetty here how safe are we on the downstream side and a good coastal engineer or a good coastal geomorphologist or geo someone can tell you okay there are people who make this their work to understand beaches beaches are very very tricky creatures you don't want to mess with them you can spend a whole lot of money and just make the problem worse but here in Clearwater, or at least this is Clearwater, um, you know, they did the right thing. Put a jetty up here that will shut down the longshore current and then leave this alone, right? Because you're probably going to lose some beach there. And if you don't have anything there, that's fine, right? So just put a park there. Let people go to the beach there. Perfect. Here's what you don't do. Uh, this is... Um, this is Upham Beach, which is just south of St. Pete. And so, uh, you know, you've got a jetty here, uh, and that's fine. But that's going to, you know, that's protecting this inlet here. That's going to, uh, you know, accumulate sand. The problem is down here, okay? They've got three condos here built way too close uh, to the... Um, to the water um and they they constantly have problems here now it doesn't look so bad now but let me show you on google earth and i'll give you an idea about what they're facing here okay so here we can see pinellas county and we can see how you know the beaches in pinellas county are barrier islands running down through here uh and so let's uh let's let's zoom in a little bit here on um on upham beach it's this bit right here um, and kind of like I said, south 
uh, South St. Pete Beach. And so here it is. Let me zoom out a little bit more. And so once again, you can see how we've got a, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. You can see we've got a, uh, a jetty up here. Um, um, blocking sediment, stopping the longshore current, blocking sediment, beach accumulation up here, and right now it doesn't look so bad on the downstream side. Now, it's out of the frame, but there's a time uh, there. Now it's in the frame. There's a time slider that we can use. So let's go back and look at this beach in 1994. It's not a great picture, but you can see the water is right up to those condos, right? And so let's step forward through time. Uh, we can see, once again, the water is right, right up uh, to those seawalls. And we'll learn about seawalls later. Seawalls don't help anything. They actually make the problem worse. And so uh, 1998, they still have a problem. Um, and we'll step forward. Let's go. Let's go forward. There we go. 2002, same thing. Uh, 2002 again, same thing. Same thing. Uh, we can see we can see that we can see the problem now we see some activity right they got a little 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 tea growing here a little tea, they got some sand on the beach so let's see if that helps and we keep going forward and now we can see this one tea growing here there's another tea growing there uh, and uh, uh, there's some sand on the beach but look nah, not so much right and yeah, it's it's doing okay but it's then eh, maybe not right look the whole thing is flooded now um yeah the water's right up against that seawall again right uh and yeah no not so much and oh more tea grinds hooray more more tea grinds uh this is 2012 uh but you can also see that despite the tea grinds there's water right up against that seawall um, I'll give it away now, guys. Seawalls cause beach erosion. They don't prevent beach erosion. Waves hit those walls and wash out sand. No problem. So we can see these tea grains are not doing much. Um, and they're continuing to not really do much. Notice the beach over here is fine. Mostly because they didn't build anything pretty much right on the water. And that's kind of the moral of the beach story is don't build too close to the water. And so um, clearly, I mean, once again, water right up to the wall, um, grass dying, I mean, not not going well. So anyway, so um, yeah, same thing, kind of same thing. Oh, look, we got sand on the beach. They nourished the beach. They pump, we'll talk about this. They pumped a bunch of sand onto the beach, right? Yay. Uh, yeah, not so much. Um, uh, it was gone in about a year. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, you're, you look, you're not going to keep sand on this beach. You're just not, right? That jetty right there is starving this beach for sand. Um, and they put these condos way too close to the water. Um, and you know, they, they, they just, they just did. And so, uh, that renourishment project really didn't work very well. They're back to putting random rocks and things on the beach, uh, which also will not really work, you know, and you can see seasonally, sometimes they have some sand, sometimes they don't, and now they do, right? I believe that's the modern picture, right? Now, you've seen the history of this area. Do you really think that sand is going to stay on that beach, right? No, right? It's it's just not. So the, the, I don't know if they've just decided that every year or two they're going to pay to nourish this beach to keep sand on it. I don't know, but we'll, you know, check back in a year and I can almost guarantee you that this newly placed sand will be gone. In fact, um, having re recording this just a day or two after Tropical Storm Ada, I'd be really interested to know what's going on out there right now. Um, my guess is it's already on its way. I mean, this was 2019. Let me see. Oh, no, that's 111.20. Okay, so that that's that's a very recent picture. Awesome. Okay, so I would be, yeah, I would be really interested in knowing what's going on out there right now. So, so anyway, so yeah, so, um, so this is the problem downstream from these jetties, right? If you're not really careful about what you do, you can have a serious, serious erosion problem. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. And through the magic of editing, we're back. Uh, let me show you another one. Um, you know, you can just kind of go on Google Earth, which is, by the way, a free download, and scroll up and down beaches and find all kinds of messed up stuff, right? This is this is up north. I honestly forget where. I think Maryland. Uh, and you can see here, uh, you know, you've got a... Uh, um, a jetty here you got a parking lot there uh and then on the downstream side you got a beach set way back 
uh, undergoing a lot of erosion, but once again, you know, there's nothing there. So at least, you know, uh, human infrastructure isn't being threatened. We could have a whole other conversation about the natural environment, but at least human infrastructure isn't being, being threatened, right? They, if someone had built a bunch of houses down here, that, that would be a nightmare. Uh, that would be a real problem. Now let's go back to Pinellas County. Let me show you another place. Uh, here, right, just north of uh, just north of St. Pete. This is Madeira Beach, okay? But look at what's happening, right? There's the inlet. Uh, look, there's a jetty. There's a jetty, right? No erosion, right? They're not. There's not a downstream side here, right? And so what they, you know, had to account for in Clearwater Beach and what absolutely bit them in the butt at, uh, at um, Upham Beach isn't even an issue at Madeira Beach. Uh, and so beaches are very, very funky, very, very tricky creatures um, that, you know, are differ widely from one to the other, just within a few miles. So what you can't get away with down in, in St. Pete Upham Beach, you can get away with in Madeira, and they got away with in Clearwater, but they had to account for it, or allow for it. So, so, so you know, once again, before you do anything to a beach, get someone in there who knows what they're talking about, and there are plenty of them around, and find out what you can and can't do, or what, what your exact situation is. Just because they got away with it here in Madeira, Madeira does not mean you're going to get away with it in St. Pete or Clearwater, or even just half a mile away. So, uh, so they're very, very changeable and very, very tricky. So that's longshore current, right? And the problems associated with the movement of barrier islands. Now, what about the larger kind of issue or picture of beach erosion? Right now, this is just the movement of the beach inland, right? That's what we're talking about. I'm, I'm not overly crazy about the term beach erosion because it kind of implies that the beach is going away it's not it's moving inland okay the problem of course is our stuff is inland right uh, okay what's going on here why why is this happening well two reasons first sea levels rising right uh, we're melting ice we're melting glaciers uh, sea levels rising the other thing is when you heat water like everything else it expands it thermally expands. So heating the planet, which we are doing, not only melts the ice, but it heats the water and causes it to thermally expand, right? Takes up more room in the basin, laps up on land, right? This is just a, 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 um, a graph of uh, mean sea level from uh, Topex Poseidon, which is a satellite, and then Jason 1, and then Jason 2, and then Jason 3, and, you know, they all, all the data sets meet, and they all show a, a general increase in sea level, okay? So, so, so there's that. The other problem is, <coughs> Once the sea level rises, or once sea level rises, that coastline now needs to come back into equilibrium with that new sea level. Okay, and this is something that people um, don't quite get a lot of times. They say, well, you know, <coughs> sorry, if the maximum flooding we're expecting is 10 feet of sea level rise, well, my house is 20 feet above sea level, so I've got 10 feet to spare, I'm good. Yeah, you're probably not. Okay, so let, let me show you why. Okay, so so here we are. Oh, oh, oh what did I do? Mm, oh, okay, I need to go forward. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, so we built a house on the beach, but we're not stupid. We didn't build it here, right? We built it back and up, and that's good. So here's sea level here. That line is supposed to be blue, but for some reason it's gray. Okay. Um, and But there's sea level. Okay, so. Let's raise sea level, right? Okay, so we raise sea level. So it comes this much closer and that much higher, but we're still good. Okay, here's the problem. See this angle? Let me go back. See this angle right here between the water and the bottom? That's called the equilibrium slope. It's a function of the wave energy, uh, the kind of sediment you have, the amount of sediment you have. There's a lot of things that go into it, but that's the equilibrium slope. That's the slope that that beach is going to have. Okay, so with that in mind, let's raise sea level again. And I look, 
and that's not the equilibrium slope, right? It's just not. It's too steep. Now, beach is going to get that slope. So, what does it do? Well, the only way it has to get that slope is to start chewing inland, right? And so, let's kind of figure out where the beach is going to be. If I extend the equilibrium slope up, I extend the water to the equilibrium slope, right? All of that goes away. Well, that's a problem, right? And if it does it again, it's going to do that again. And if it continues to rise, it's going to do that, right? The problem, right, when we think about, you know, when we think about images of coastal erosion, it's not that houses are being flooded. It's that they're being undermined, right? I mean, whoever owned this house... Uh, you know, pro well, okay, I don't mean to say bad things about people, but, you know, the per you can easily imagine the person who owned that house going, well, yeah, but even with sea level rise, my house is still a solid 10 feet above sea level. Okay, doesn't help. <laughs> it does not help um, if, a, if the ground underneath your house is being washed away as the beach reattains that equilibrium slope, right? And so if you're thinking about sea level rise and you're thinking about, you know, I don't know, 20 feet of sea level rise, okay, that doesn't mean that, you know, everything above 20 feet on a contour map or something is okay. You have to allow for that, that, that sea level rising 20 feet and then chewing its way inland until it reacquires that equilibrium slope, right? And that's what we're facing around the world as sea levels rise. It's not, you know, they, they, people like to say coastal flooding. And yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it never happens, but, but you know, the, the more pressing thing is undermining right not flooding so it's not as simple as you know these people are a solid 50 feet above sea level i don't think that's going to help uh if it rises anymore assuming it's not in equilibrium yet so okay so this is a problem how do we stop it hmm interesting question isn't it um our first impulse is always 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 hard stabilization right let's pour some concrete and the first thing people want to do is build a seawall i said this before and i'll say it again seawalls do not um stop beach erosion seawalls cause beach erosion right because what happens here and this is a drawing from the army corps of engineers you got a beach here that's in danger you put a seawall on it well what happens is the minute that wave touches that wall as you can see here now i'm cheating this is a storm but you get the idea um the minute that wave touches that wall some of that water goes up but a lot of it goes down into that sand right next thing you know that water is right up against that wall i mean ask yourself uh, as you drive around Pinellas County and look at seawalls, I'm not saying anyone's evil for having a seawall. I mean, no. Okay, we're not going there. But as you drive around Pinellas County, ask yourself, how often do you see a seawall with any beach between the wall and the water? Okay, and very rarely... Okay, in almost every case, that water comes right up to that wall, right? And we remember Upham Beach, uh, and I won't go back and do the time hop thing again or the time thing again because, no. But, but you know, these seawalls here are not helping at all. I mean, you know, they're just not because, we'll not at least with respect to the beach, um, they do an okay job of protecting what's behind them, but you're never going to have any beach in front of them. You're just not. And so now, without that beach in front of you, storms are suddenly a much bigger deal, right? And you know, and if you let it, you know, if 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 you just leave it, it'll undermine the wall. The wall falls, and now this whole thing is going to go like in a week. So you have to be, you know, it's just that ah, they're not, you know, they're they're you know, really tricky. Um, and so so yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say there. Sea walls you know don't don't preserve beach yeah and so the minute you know the minute enough of the sand is removed that these this wave energy even touches that wall that beach will be gone in a few hours uh it, it 
does not take long. Now, you can build higher tech seawalls, right? You can put rock in front of the seawall to keep that sediment from being washed away. Here's another one that's kind of built at an angle so that the wave energy is dissipated with rock here. But you'll notice this isn't a beach, right? No, no one's going to pay money to come and put up a, a, you know, a beach blanket on this. No, right? No, that, that's not what that is. Uh, you know, I believe, I want to say this one's in Galveston. I'm not sure where this one is. The fact that it ends right there leads me to believe Galveston because theirs just kind of stops. Um, so yeah, because right, the fundamental thing here is when that wave energy hits that wall, some of it goes up, but a lot of it goes down and it just washes out that beach. And so, you know, yeah, you put something there to keep that from happening and that'll kind of protect your seawall and kind of protect what's behind it. But you're not going to get uh, that, that's not a beach, not, not, not in the sense of, you know, sand that people want to pay money to come and hang out on and stuff like that. So we need to kind of, maybe we need to build a beach somehow. Uh, well, okay. So let's say that we, um, let's say that we do that. Uh, so we know a little bit. We know that if we build a wall rock out into the water, it traps sediment on the upstream side. Well, why don't we use that to build a beach? Right? When you build a wall out like that, it's called a groin. Um, and so you can see this, this is on the south side of Long Island, actually. And you can see the thing about groins, right? Is this person builds one and okay, but if they don't put another one here, you're going to get sand accumulated up here and erosion down here. So they build a groin, right? And so now, you know, okay, well now we need another one here to trap sediment. We need another one here. It's not a matter of building usually one groin okay because the downstream side you're going to have issues and so what you end up with <coughs> is not usually one but multiples so that you continue to trap seven now the, the trick here is at some point you gotta stop <laughs> and so you want to be once again really careful about what you do uh, downstream. Uh, you don't want to put anything downstream because you're going to have a problem keeping sand on that beach downstream. Uh, let's go back to the, to the former side of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. It used to sit right there. Um, and you can see they put a groin here uh, for what it's worth um, to, I think, try and, I don't know, preserve the beach. They put another one here. This I looked at this I was like, huh, because you're accumulating sand uh, on the inside of these two, right? that's not usually the way that works. Uh, so there's something funky going on here uh, with the longshore current and whatnot. I don't know. I'd like to get out there and maybe take a look at it sometime. But, but um, you know, in this case, it was just almost useless. I mean, th these things aren't really doing anything. Um, if we come back to, to Pinellas County and we look, this is the channel uh, uh, this is Clearwater Beach up here and whatever the island is to the south. And this is the channel. There's that big bridge that goes over uh, um, th that inlet. And so Clearwater Beach is kind of up here. We can see that these, these hotels here um, have built some groins uh, to, to make sure they have little beaches in front of them. Right? Just barely holding on to a little bit of sand. These are tea groins, which are kind of like a seawall. Or a, a, I don't know, a, yeah, yeah, like a seawall or a breakwater, which we'll talk about in a minute, with a with a groin coming up to it. Very popular structures around here, uh, and you know they're they're trapping a fair amount of sediment. And I don't know, maybe they're adding sediment and just kind of keeping it. Um, I suspect these people here are. But the problem, of course, is here. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to build there, but uh, they're going to have some issues uh, keeping sand in front of whatever they're going to put here. And so, uh, and that's kind of always the way it is, right? Uh, is, you know, you, 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 you eventually someone's going to be lacking for sediment. If we go to Long Beach, um, California, we can see uh, a groin here, um, you know, sand accumulating on the upstream side and Oh, this is a little tricky. All right, right in here. Big old oil refiner. Big oil refiner back in here. If you've ever been to Long Beach, California, it's a very industrial city. Um, but, you know, uh, sand accumulation up here. Oh, not much beach at all down here. Uh, fortunately, here they put that parking lot a little bit further back. So they've got, or that's not a park. Those are houses. I checked. Those are houses packed in there but fortunately they're a little bit further back so they got a, a bit more beach there and this is this is you know 
this is kind of what we've seen over and over again, right? Is it's not so much that the beach is, you know, you get the beach moving. It's you got stuff there. Don't put stuff so close to the dang water, especially not just downstream from a groin. That, that could be a real problem. Um, just north of here, we have another structure, uh, a breakwater. Here's a breakwater here. Um, and uh, what this does is that they were originally meant to shut down the wave energy to make it easier for people to get their boats in these inlets. Uh, but when you shut down the wave energy, you shut down the longshore current. And so you can see here that while there is more sediment accumulating here, they're not having much of an erosion problem downstream here. We're accumulating sand on both sides of the jetty. Uh, and so, you know, this seems is like it's working pretty well here. And it is. It, it definitely is. I looked around here and on down here, they're not really having any erosion problems. But that's not always the case, right? The thing about a beach is, right, and we've seen this, and let me come out and say it. Whenever you trap water in one place... I'm sorry, let me start again, not water. Whenever you trap sand in one place, you starve it in another, right? So if I'm trapping sand on the upstream side of a jetty or a groin, what's going on on the downstream side? Be very, very careful on that downstream side. Same thing here with this breakwater, right? I'm trapping a sand here. I keep wanting to say water. I'm trapping sand here. I need to be very careful down here, right? And let me let me show you. This ends up playing out the way uh, the way those groins played out, right? Where you know you you end up you know these people build a breakwater, they get a beach, uh, but these people um, you know their beach is going away because all the sand is up here, so they build a breakwater and then they build it, and you can see how. By the time you're down here, you're out of sand. You are out of sand, right? And the you know, beaches set neighbors against each other. They really do. Because, you know, suddenly these people are pissed at these people. Uh, and so they, you know, it's just, just on and on and on. And so, and so, yeah, if we want to come a little bit closer to home, uh, Honeymoon Island. Um, uh, they, they have breakwaters at Honeymoon Island. And this is another case where I want to take a look at this on Google Earth. So I'll be right back with Google Earth. Okay, so here we are looking at Honeymoon Island. A uh, big parking lot down here, a snack bar right there. Uh, parking lot here. It's a really, it's a really pretty place. Um, I go, I usually go hiking up in here uh, where there's fewer people and stuff. But it's a, it's a very, very pretty place. Costs a few bucks to get onto it. Uh, it's maintained by the Park Service or something like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice place. Uh, if you're a chance and you haven't been, go. It's very cool. Okay, so we can do that time hop, time loop, time thing again. Let me do that. I keep thinking about like Facebook and that silly time hop thing they do. Okay, so anyway, uh, so let's go back to uh, 1995. And so we see a very different area. We see, well, actually not very different. We see pretty much the same thing, right? You got, you got a parking lot here. They don't have that snack bar there yet. Uh, we got two structures here uh, and a parking lot. Uh, this part, These parking lots are a bit closer to the beach than this one is. Uh, and you can see that they've got a groin here. Uh, presumably to preserve the beach, you know, in front of these parking lots, right? So they got, they put it, they put a groin in. So let's see how this plays out. So 98, yeah, pretty much the same. Um, yep, yep, yep. I think, did we lose a structure? I think we might've lost a structure. Oh, no, we didn't. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So let's see. So, oh yeah, no, no, we didn't. Okay. So anyway, things are, you know, eh, it's, it's okay. Uh, and so we go on. And now we're getting some color photography. We still got structures. Things are good. Things are good. And okay, uh, now we're getting some problems, right? Because look, I mean, mm, people are parking in the water. I <laughs> mean, not really, but you get the idea. There, remember, let's keep it on these two structures because this this one's this one's out in the Gulf. So that one um, is not going to last. Let's get to a good picture. And uh, that one's not going to last, right? So here we go. You know, beaches, they kind of come and they kind of go. You have to look at kind of the large trend. And the large trend here is not good. Um, and yeah, whatever structure was there is gone. That one's still there. Groin is still there. Uh, this beach over here is fine. Uh, the parking lot's further back, though, right? And we, that's an old story, right, that we, we should know by now. Uh, and, yeah, so groin is still there, um, but it's questionable what it's really accomplishing, right? Mostly it's trapping sand right here where they don't really need sand. We've lost that structure that was there by now. Uh, and so we just kind of keep going here and we can see, you know, that that groin is holding, oh, now they nourished it, right? Sand on the beach. Hooray. That was in 2008. 
and by 2010 the sand that they put on the beach is pretty much gone uh, they added a they added a breakwater here uh, to try to try and help things uh, but look their renourishment project is gone right it, it, their nerd their beach nourishment project where they added sand is just gone and so uh, yeah the breakwater is doing a pretty good job but it's only doing it here right where ironically enough there's nothing there <laughs> over here uh they're having issues uh notice that the structure that was there is gone they built another they built another bathhouse kind of back here because that one was just not i don't know when they got rid. i don't know when it went uh we won't go back and look but at some point they're like nope not gonna work put another one back there right and so um and so that breakwater there is doing a pretty good job, but it's just doing it there. So what do you do? Add some more breakwaters, right? Uh, put the breakwaters where you're actually having the erosion problem. Crazy, I know. Uh, but once you do that, now we can see the breakwaters doing what they're supposed to do, and that's trapping uh, that sediment. And the good news is they've never had an erosion problem on the downstream side here uh, because they don't have their parking lot so close to the beach so they're they're pretty safe trapping some sediment up here to to make sure these parking lots don't get flooded uh, even as it is i mean if you've been here you know this part of this parking lot is the beach uh, it's sandy. Uh, I don't even think you can hardly park there. And here we are 2019. And if I get rid of it entirely, there we are uh, with breakwaters protecting this beach. And they're doing a pretty good job. Um, I might be inclined to put another one right about there where my hand is. But they're doing a pretty good job. And once again, they're safe on the downstream side because they didn't build that too close to the beach. Right? They've got plenty of beach here. Uh, although that's looking a little narrow, uh, but uh, ostensibly, hopefully, they've got plenty of beach here uh, that they won't have. A, they won't have a problem. So, so you know, I'm not, I'm not saying hard stabilization is bad. I'm saying be careful. Be careful how you use it. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, back to the PowerPoint, and let's talk about quickly about beach renourishment or beach nourishment. Right? Um, we do a lot of this in Pinellas County. A lot of it. Um, they just finished a big project up on, um, Indian Rocks Beach, uh, oh, I don't know, I think a year ago now, uh, that we do a lot of this, okay, uh, and, uh, so the idea here is that if your beach needs sand, add sand to the beach, right? <laughs> simple enough um and it's not simple it's not simple at all. in fact it's really tricky to get it right uh you have to match the sand you can't just pump any old sand up on the beach and if the right sand isn't local now you got to haul it in and that's even more expensive uh we're dealing with on the order of one to two million dollars per mile and so yeah the other thing is um it's it's really temporary um um it's never a permanent solution. Uh, you can always buy yourself time, you know, uh, but it's not a permanent solution. And we've seen enough beach, we've seen two beach renourishment projects go away now within a year, one in Upham Beach and one in Honeymoon Island, uh, to, to understand that. Now, well-designed one will last longer. Um, and, you know, you, if you do it a lot, you buy yourself a lot of time. In other words, if you make the beach really wide, uh, you buy yourself, you know, a lot of time. Um, but you're still just buying time until you have to do it again. Uh, you know, and we, we, you know, th there's always the environmental issues of your, you know, if you're pumping that sand from offshore, you're sucking up one ecosystem into a pipe and dumping it on top of another ecosystem. And that, that could be a problem. So, uh, you know, but, but we do it, we do it because we don't have any choice. We just don't, there's various funding mechanisms, ways they work out the money, but you know, but we do it because we, you just, it's like, you just grit your teeth and do it because you don't have any choice. Um, and so, but let's take a look at why they're temporary. So let's go back to our, 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 um, our flooding beach here. Um, and so let's say we want to re-nourish it, right? And so, so someone goes up before the county commissioners and says, okay, uh, I can give you, let's say that's a hundred feet of beach, uh, and I'll charge you a million dollars a mile, and that's what it looks like, okay, from the side. Here's the problem, right? This is not the equilibrium slope, right? It's too steep. 
And so in addition to whatever was causing the problem before, be it longshore current, rising sea levels, whatever, now the beach is also going to start chewing through because that's the wrong slope, right? This is the angle that it wants, and so it's going to chew through that beach renourishment project. So another person comes up before the county commissioners and says, okay, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to give you the same amount of beach, but we're going we're gonna to lessen that slope. Um, and we're going to shape it in a fancy way. It's going to take twice as much sand, so it's going to cost you twice as much money. Plus, I'm hiring, you know, coastal engineers, not dudes with bulldozers. Um, and, you know, we're going to do a good job, but it's going to cost $2 million per mile. All right, you know, yeah, okay, so we all know how this works, right? More often than not, they're going to go with that. Because it's the same amount of beach, but in a year it'll be gone, right? This one will last longer, okay? So it's definitely to your advantage to invest in a better uh, beach nourishment project. Someone who really actually knows what they're doing. It, it's always temporary, but it'll last longer, okay? Now, there's another thing, and then I'm done. I got one slide on it. Um, and that is something called soft stabilization, um, soft stabilization is what you do to maintain your beach. It's not going to fix any problems, okay, but it will keep problems from cropping up, right? And soft stabilization is using natural materials, right? Use shells to arbor the beach. Use driftwood. Plant native grasses that keep beaches from blowing away. Uh, you know how people are really touchy about walking through sea oats? Yeah, that's because um, you, you kill those sea oats and that, that, that sand dune is going to literally blow away. Uh, and so you want to be very, very careful about that. The ecosystems on beaches are very fragile too. And so uh, soft stabilization seeks to use these natural materials to keep the problems from coming up to start with. This will work great if your beach isn't too far gone. This will not work on Upham Beach or somewhere where you have an active problem. Right? You, can't, you can't save a beach by putting shells and wood on it if it's just fundamentally in a bad situation. Okay, so there's beach erosion. I'll get this uploaded. I'll send out an email letting you know it's there. And we'll move on next time. Everyone take care. Bye-bye.